Hi, Brielle. If you're just coming in, we've got one handout. Front table. Good morning, Becca. Good morning, Jenny. We have one handout on the front table. Karen made that. that, made that. It's, a, it's a patch of cortex. <laughs> it's a patch of cortex. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, everyone. We have one handout on the front table if you're just coming in. <laughs> it's an anniversary gift to me from her. It was our second anniversary is when she should be in there. So that's a, a patch of cortex. Uh, she quoted that, yeah. I'll never forget that job talking to you. Right, right. Where did you make that? A patch of cortex. Is that gorgeous? And the color, the blobs? The blobs are the different orientation columns in the cortex, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, we've got 8.30. Why don't we get started? Good morning, s and Wow, that, that's a pretty good response. Um, welcome to Wednesday of week number seven. I've got some great news, as I always do here at, in s and and that is we're coming up on an exam. Let's give it up for the exam. Yay, all right. So here we are talking about form perception today on October 7th, and you know what that means. Our next meeting is October 9th. We've already done this twice, but I, or at least once before, but I thought I'd just put this up one more time. This is available to you on Blackboard and also on the S Drive, so you can always check this out. This is the same format as last time. I won't walk through every one of the steps. I'll just call your attention to the exam will be cumulative, but we'll emphasize the material since the last exam. Okay? So the material that's starting anew was September 23rd, uh, and so you might want to emphasize all of that. And here's the format, the content, and maybe some uh, suggestions on how to study. We've gone through that before. Um, we'll, uh, we'll let you take a look at that out on Blackboard or on the S Drive as you like. Okay? Um, something else that I thought I'd mention is as we're looking at the big calendar here for the semester, we've got the exam coming up on Friday, uh, and then the paper that will be due next is paper number two. And I think you're going to find this to be very, very interesting. It will emphasize our power and justice component. So we'll combine some of the physiology and the psychophysics and the perceptual experiences with what goes on in terms of a, a person's social status uh, in these power and justice kinds of issues. And we have the handout. Does everybody have the handout for next Wednesday's paper? Yep, okay. Uh, that is due, oh, I'm sorry, that is due Wednesday, and uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, that's the 16th, as when that's due. Uh, I should have said Wednesday there. If you want to cross that out, that's due Wednesday. Wednesday the 16th. Thank you, Chelsea. Okay? <clears throat> All right, I wonder if uh, we can get somebody to um, read the three components here, one, two, and three. So we'll have you write an essay on the components after you've read these three readings that are in the course hand pack. I wonder if we can just get real clear on what the overall topics are going to be here. Um, can somebody read for us? We have a volunteer reader on items one, two, and three. Okay, thanks, Emily. Yeah, yeah, if you would. Yes. Of 
Okay, thank you very much, Emily. So when you bring that in, we'll put those on the table on that Wednesday, and then we'll just say go, and we'll have our student-generated discussion, and, and we'll see what kinds of ideas you have. Last time we did this, we had a, a really terrific discussion. It was really nicely distributed, and there were lots of great ideas. So I look forward to the conversation that, that we might have on that. I think you'll really enjoy this idea of the, the island of Pingalap. This really is an island in the South Pacific where a lot of folks are colorblind, so it's not at all uh, unusual for uh, individuals to run into folks who are very, very colorblind. And so their social situation is a little bit different there. Here, somebody who might be colorblind is at a bit of a disadvantage and is somewhat socially isolated because it's a relatively rare, rarely occurring item. Uh, and there, it's really quite pervasive. So the numbers have changed. And it's interesting to see how the social environment changes when you now have a large minority, a very, very large minority, that has a rather severe form of colorblindness. And this is all going on on the island of Pingalap. Um, so uh, this is written by Oliver Sacks, who I think you'll find to be a, a really intriguing writer. Okay. Okay. Any questions on the writing assignment due for next Wednesday? All right. I look forward to your responses on that. And what we'll do then to get set up for today's conversation uh, is we'll take a look at some of the PowerPoint files. Uh, we'll go to the 10.9 file, which is right for today. And this had uh, a lot of different components. We were talking about form perception. That's our topic for today. And we had uh, these different components in, in the PowerPoint. Um, lots of different ways to go with this. First, I wonder if uh, people can uh, all yell this out in unison. One of the main ideas here is FAPO. Okay, FAPO is one of the acronyms. So I wonder if we can uh, all yell out the F in FAPO stands for? Frequency. All right. And, and the A in FAPO stands for? Amplitude. And the P in FAPO stands for? Base. And the O in? Yeah, <laughs> okay, you're ahead of me, real good, real good. Okay, what I love about this is that it used to take me about uh, 20 minutes or so to get to that point, right? And now everybody walks in and, and everybody can yell out what, what FAPO is and what FAPO is doing for us, okay? All right, so we have uh, our idea of what FAPO is. Um, uh, and why don't we do it this way? Um, we can think a little bit about this notion. We can think about the frequency in particular. And I wonder if somebody can just walk us through this slide a little bit and uh, tell us what we mean by frequency <laughs> using this slide. Do we have anybody who can sort of teach us what's cooking here in this slide? I'll turn down this front light so we might get a little better contrast. Anybody want to help us? OK, thanks, Emily. Uh, so when we're looking at cycles, we're looking at the iterations of patterns. OK. Okay. Black bar, the white bar, that's one cycle, right. and then two cycles. Uh -huh. And underneath, for every um, one of those patterns, there are the cycles, there's four. Okay. Um, there are two, there's two. Mm -hmm. right? um, so it's going to have a higher spatial frequency because there are um, more cycles per degree. And when we're talking about degree, we're talking about um, like a visual angle. Okay, really great. For those of you who are sitting in front of Emily, you can't see the gesture that she just ended with. And that gesture was this. What was this gesture all about? What was, what was that thing? Uh, the degree of visual angle, right? So she's, she's made a lot of great comments here. We're talking about cycles per degree of visual angle. And we hold out our thumb at arm's length, and we had done that demo before, and we did it in part to find the blind spot, but also in part to get some feel for how big one degree of visual angle is. So we can typically express frequency in terms of the number of cycles per degree. I love the way that she described a cycle as a complete iteration of a pattern. So here's a black component, here's a white component. We go black, white, that's the complete cycle, and then we repeat that cycle. That complete iteration of the pattern is the cycle. And the cycles are occurring twice as frequently per unit space in the lower bit here than in the, the upper bit. This is the higher spatial frequency, okay? Who's following that? That's usually the one that tends to confuse students a little bit. And it just, uh, I, maybe it's counterintuitive to think of something that's actually narrower as being higher, but it actually is higher in spatial frequency. And as we'll talk about later on today, there's this uh, inverse relationship between frequency and wavelength. So uh, here we're talking about frequencies. Higher frequencies will have shorter wavelengths. This is relatively short. This is relatively wide. Okay, here's something that I, I did just for the first time the last semester when I was teaching this course, and it occurred to me that this might be a really, uh, a really nice way of thinking about spatial frequencies. Do we have any musicians in the room? Anybody here a musician of any variety? A few of us are musicians. Uh, among our musicians, has anybody heard of an octave 
or even if you're not a musician, maybe you've heard of an octave, okay? Um, Kirsten, you've heard of an octave? Um, what, do you, what do you know about octaves, if you know anything about them? Okay, anybody want to tell us what an octave might be? We'll go with Becca and then with Harshida. It's like one set of all the notes, and if you go up an octave, it's higher frequency. Okay, so, yeah. Okay, so if you go up an octave, you've gone to a higher frequency. Anything that you'd like to add to that? Uh, actually, it doesn't have to be a set of eight. I mean, by coincidence, there might be an eight, but you see the root word oct in there, and it might fool us into thinking that it's always about eight. Okay? You know what an octave actually is in music? It's, it's many of the things that have been described here. It is a frequency doubling. So if I have a particular frequency in sound, and then I double that frequency, I've gone up by an octave in frequency space. Okay? Who's following that? that word? So here, we're actually showing you a visual octave. Anybody have an idea of a song, or maybe uh, just not even a song, but how an octave might sound in music? So here's a visual stimulus. What would that sound like? If we could play that visual stimulus auditorily and hear it as a musical sound, what, what might that sound like? The change from that stimulus to that stimulus. Yeah. I'm not going to sing it. Yeah. Okay, really good, between an alto and a soprano. That's actually a very good guess. It might be that there are many musical pieces where the alto would be singing this and the soprano would be singing that. On average, it is said that the adult male voice is about an octave lower than the adult female voice. So if this were the male pattern, that would be the female pattern. Okay, Let's see if I can tap out a little tune. Uh, this is all going to be done on a, a piano keyboard. Um, anybody recognize this tune? Who recognizes that? Okay, what is that? Somewhere over the rainbow. Let's do that very first opening pair of, of notes. Okay, that is that. Somewhere, <laughs> okay, somewhere. All right, so that's what's going on in, in terms of um, musical correlates to this visual spatial frequency. And later on in the semester, we will be talking about auditory frequencies, and they work on some level the same way. We still have uh, these cycles, these complete iterations of patterns, and they might happen many, many times per unit time, or many, many times per unit space. Here we're talking about spatial frequencies, okay? All right, uh, the other one that throws people just a little bit sometimes is this notion. Uh, actually, contrast they tend to get. When people are right with contrast, I want to make sure that we are okay there. We talked about the Mickelson contrast formula, L max minus L min over L max plus L min is how we, we develop a contrast here. Okay, this idea of phase, and in the video I talked about the 360 degrees that we would have in a circle, and we can go half the way around, which would be how many degrees half the way around? 180. 180, okay. Anybody know how to express that in terms of radians? It's okay if you don't, but... Pi, pi, okay, so there are two pi radians in the full circle, and then pi radians would be half the way around. Sometimes people express angles um, by talking about degrees. There's an equivalent unit of measure called a radian that you wouldn't necessarily have to know, but some of us learn trigonometry in radians rather than in degrees, but same kind of a thing, okay? So what we can say is we can go through the complete um, cycle, and then we start again. So we can think of going all the way around, and then we start again all the way around. Here, where this guy is starting half the way through that guy's phase, if that, that works for us. So this was said to be 180, degree, uh, 180 degrees out of phase with that one. Who's following that? Okay. All right, that was the other one that was a little bit difficult for some students historically, and then orientation is something that everybody gets very intuitively. Okay. All right. Any questions on any of that? Or comments on any of that? Yes, please. Yeah. Is it different from what we usually know as frequency? Is it any reason why there's frequency? Good, good. So uh, for those in the back who might not have heard that, Harshida's question was, throughout this presentation in the video and several times today, I've already talked about spatial frequencies. And she wanted to know, why am I qualifying the word spatial frequency? Uh, why don't I just use the word frequency? Well, uh, there are all kinds of 
different flavors of frequencies, but they all uh, follow this, uh, this notion of a complete iteration of a pattern. Right? That's, that's, we're going to talk about how many complete iterations we have, either per unit space or per unit time. So uh, the reason that I call these spatial frequencies is that as we go through the semester, we're going to learn that our brain basically picks up all kinds of frequencies. We pick up spatial frequencies. Uh, as you're doing right now, as you're looking at me, you're seeing spatial frequencies. And as you're hearing my voice, you're picking up something called temporal frequencies. When I tapped out somewhere, a moment ago on the, the piano keyboard, those are temporal frequencies that your ear is picking up. So sometimes we want to uh, describe something in a frequency domain and we might specify whether it's spatial or temporal. Okay? But they, they both are wave-like patterns, right, uh, in, in either case. Right. All right, real good. Okay, uh, I wonder if we could go to, let's see, um, oh, we'll ask you to see if you have any questions about this. We had this very uh, colorful pattern here. Hopefully people were able to make some sense out of that. I think we can have this sinusoidally varying luminance gradation. Okay, that might have been clear. Okay. Um, here's where the students sometimes get lost. We are describing today things in two different domains. The space domain, which is very, very uh, known to you. This is, this is very intuitive. Um, the, the brilliance of Fourier comes in the frequency domain, right? Trying to explain something that we see so obviously in space, trying to convey it into the frequency domain, either spatial frequencies or later on in the semester temporal frequencies to get back to Harshita's point. So here's the genius of Fourier trying to explain something in uh, maybe a less intuitive manner. Here's a pattern. Here's a very different pattern. First of all, is everybody okay with this one being visually a higher spatial frequency than that one? Does that work for us? Okay. And then what we can do is we can have something like a space domain and a frequency domain a description of all of these. Here's the space domain. So we have relatively high regions of luminance and lower regions of luminance. These are now modulating sinusoidally. The same thing over here. If this were a perfect diagram, this would be a little bit lower contrast than I think it actually is because we have these smaller amplitude waves and bigger amplitude waves over here. So this should be really light to really dark and then moderately dark to moderately light would be ideal if they could have captured that. But who's following the correspondence between this and that? Is that working for us? Okay, so this is a real stimulus. And then as we often do in, uh, in science, we try to describe that stimulus. And we can have a space domain description. And here we're getting a lambda indication. Remember that lambda is going to be wavelength, as we said. And we'll have the length from here to here. And that's going to be a lot bigger than the length from here to here. Peak to peak might be our, our length. Okay, here's where it gets just a little bit challenging where we sometimes lose a student or two. We now bring on the brilliance of Fourier and we take all the same information that we have and we add one more description that might buy us something a little bit later on. And now what we have is no longer wavelength. This is very subtle. I hope you'll catch this. Here's wavelength, here's wavelength lambda. Okay. Now what we can do is we can take the inverse of wavelength and that's going to be frequency, one over lambda. And you might catch that down here. That might have been really, really subtle. And if you have your PowerPoint lecture notes printed in front of you, it might not be really obvious, but this is the frequency axis. It has an F there. And frequency is the same as one over wavelength. Wavelength and frequency are inversely related. Who's okay with that, that inverse relationship? Please go ahead, Becca. Um, so, in, excuse me. In that second graph, is, um, is wavelength plotted as a function of frequency, or is contrast different from? Because it says contrast there. Yeah, over here it says contrast. Yeah. Right, okay. So we're using contrast uh, really sy synonymously with luminance. We, we can think of, there's a lot of, there is allegedly a lot of uh, luminance contrast up here, and uh, there's allegedly less luminance <laughs> contrast here. Okay, so we can think of luminance as being amplitude, if you like, uh, or contrast. We'll, we'll use amplitude in, in both cases. Okay, so we use contrast as a synonym. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so this is one over lambda, which is frequency. All right, that's the first bit. And now what we can say is that our frequencies can go from zero off to infinity. So these are lower frequencies and they're getting higher as we go from left to right. And so this is a relatively low frequency, but high amplitude stimulus. So the amplitude is up a bit and we're kind of leftish. If we try to describe this guy using the frequency domain, we'd have to have a spike that's further to the right which is to say a higher frequency, but it's also going to be less in amplitude only because this is lower in amplitude than that guy is. Who's following that? That work for us? Okay, and Harshida has a question. Um, does amplitude basically measure luminance? Yes, yeah, so amplitude, we're gonna use amplitude um, and luminance, that's actually really the, um, the change in amplitude. 
right, or the change in luminance. So really high luminance to really low luminance, and this peak to trough difference would be our amplitude. We can think of that also as the contrast. There's a bigger contrast between that guy and that guy than between that guy and that guy. All right, so really cool that Fourier has this insight. And he's just been hired, as we say in the video, by Napoleon to build a better cannon. <laughs> right, that's what he's trying to do. And he's thinking about how heat moves through metals. And he's got this notion about um, being able to uh, think about something this way, but then also express it this way, which is a little bit less intuitive, but turns out to be pretty handy scientifically. Okay, what I would like to do is maybe have you help me walk through uh, a Fourier decomposition of something like this. This is one of the more difficult slides of the entire semester. So we'll see if anybody can uh, at least get us started. Is it okay if you can't go all the way through? Anybody want to try to get us started? Okay, Becca, thank you for being brave enough to get us started. So embedded uh, in the, uh, the square wave at the bottom are these many different sine waves. And so um, going back up to the top, if you um, add the two here together, uh -huh. um, it starts to create that square wave where you have, it, it starts to create the pattern of um, what is on the bottom. Okay. Um, okay, let's, let's pause right there. And that's, that's actually a wonderful introduction and it's spot on. And it makes maybe the most profound point of the entire session, which is that anything that you can possibly look at, anything that you've ever seen, anything that you ever will see, can be decomposed into its Fourier components. We can break anything that you can see down into a whole bunch of sine waves, believe it or not. So what we're going to do today, as Becca mentioned, is we're going to start out with a relatively simple square wave pattern. Right? We have an on section, an off section, an on section, an off section. It's a boring stimulus, but it gets the conversation going. Inside of this square wave pattern, she's saying that we can unpack it and we can find all the different sine wave components that are there. And this is true for anything that you can possibly be looking at. It just so happens to be a relatively simple case. If we look at the square wave, we get a very, very nice uh, sequence of sine waves. But that was the main idea. So thank you for that, Becca. First, who's following that? Okay. And the same thing, by the way, is going to be true for anything that you ever heard. So my voice, which is coming to you now, can be decomposed into a bunch of sine waves. And actually, as you're hearing my voice right now, that's exactly what your, uh, your inner ear is doing. Your inner ear is decomposing my voice into a bunch of sine waves in sound. And your eye brain system is decomposing everything that you're looking at right now into a bunch of sine waves. Uh, really quite quite interesting. And Emily has a, a question on that. Thank you, Emily. So is sine waves used synonymously with Fourier components? Yes, yes. The Fourier components are going to be different, uh, different sine waves. Okay? And so we'll walk through this and, and make that point really, really clearly. And then we'll go over to something that we've got on the board uh, that might help us. But Yuen has a, a question also, or a comment. I'm confused with uh, the expression of fx. Is it the, like the function of mm -hmm. Yeah, we can think of it that, um, or we can, we can also think of it as, um, you can think of it as the frequency of x. So uh, it's f of x. Yes, yeah, you can, think of, you can think of f of x, and as we'll see in a moment, that's going to be, these are going to be different frequencies. So we'll, if you'll just allow us to walk through, and this is a little bit subtle, okay? But it's really helpful to think about the end product. Let's say we wanted to understand how it is that we're seeing this, okay? Now, what we can say is we can decompose this into as many different sinusoidal components. So, way up top, if you'll all join me, let's take a look at what we're going to call the fundamental frequency. That's going to be the lowest frequency in any particular pattern. So here's one pattern, and there's going to be something that has the lowest frequency. So it goes light, dark, light, dark, and then right next to that, we see its frequency, uh, its description, excuse me, in the space domain. It goes up and then down, and then up, and then down, and then we have its description in the frequency domain. Okay, so we have the original stimulus, space domain, frequency domain, and we can think of that as the sine f of x, where f might be, in this case, the, the frequency. Um, first, how many people are following that for the very top stimulus? Is that working? Okay. And then Harshida also had a question. I actually do follow okay. that. I'm just asking why. Shouldn't that image have more contrast? Yeah, yeah, so sorry, by the time these things get photocopied like six times into a PowerPoint slide, we, we lose some of the, okay, but, so thank you for that, okay? Uh, that question was, uh, these don't appear to necessarily match the exact um, amplitudes and contrast levels, but that's the best we can do with photocopying. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to go up to a slightly higher frequency, so hopefully you can see here that we're going dark light, dark light, dark light at a faster rate per unit space, and that's shown here. Okay? And we're also getting less contrast, at least allegedly, if we had better copies. And so now we get another spike, just like we had a moment ago. It's less contrasty, so we're down a little bit. 
um, but it's also further to the right, it's one-third um, the, uh, the amplitude, but it's three times the frequency. And maybe this gets back to Yuen's point. Okay? One-third the amplitude and three times the frequency. Does that work for you, Yuen? Okay. And now if we just add these two together, so we take the upper left component we, uh, of that first stimulus, the upper left component of the second stimulus, we add them together and we get this guy, okay? and we do that point by point, and that plus that adds up to that. Okay? Right? And then if we look at how this thing is tracing out, it's starting to approximate a square wave, but we're not there yet. It's still a little bit bumpy. Okay? Then what we can do is add another component. We're going up by odd numbers now. So we might add a really, really high frequency, one-fifth the amplitude five times the frequency. Okay? We're going to uh, put that one in here. Okay? And we add that to the mix, and we're starting to get better and better approximations if we added a seventh, a ninth, an eleventh. We added all these odd harmonics, as it turns out. Um, we wind up with a uh, perfect square wave. So I'm going to turn the front light up a little bit, and we'll just see if we can unpack some of that terminology. We have the fundamental frequency, which is the lowest frequency in a series or the lowest frequency in a waveform. Okay? So that's the fundamental. And then if we want to build up a square wave, and this only works for square waves, but it, it's a really nice example, uh, we can add harmonics, as they're called. Harmonics would be integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. So just multiplying by ones, twos, threes, no, none of this fractional multiplication. And we're going up by some, multiplica uh, some multiplicative factor, three, five, for example. Okay. So we start out with a fundamental frequency. We'll call that a frequency of one. Uh, the amplitude is said to be one. And then we'll add the next odd harmonic. These are the different harmonics there. Three times the frequency, one-third the amplitude. And we'll go to the next odd component, the odd harmonic, five times the frequency, one-fifth the amplitude, seven, nine, and so forth down the line. Now this isn't true for every single image. This just happens to be you, how you could decompose a square wave into its sinusoidal components. And you can get better and better approximations of this square wave uh, using uh, this this kind of decomposition. So who's following that general idea? It's a very, very counterintuitive idea. I hope you feel somewhat privileged to understand this, that uh, Fourier himself lived only in the late 1700s, and most of humanity had visual experiences not unlike yours for uh, their entire lifetimes. Each individual would have that. But relatively few people have an understanding of how it is that their brain is putting together these images. And we have now a lot of evidence suggesting that your brain is decomposing anything. We'll start with a very simple stimulus here into its Fourier components. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. How do people think that's counterintuitive? <laughs> That wasn't really obvious, right? I mean, even if you understand it now, it wasn't really obvious that your brain is performing a sine wave-based decomposition on everything you've ever seen. You see an apple, you see a, uh, a boat out on the ocean, right? Your, your brain's doing a Fourier analysis on all of that. Um, sine waves everywhere. Yes, please, go ahead. So if you keep adding more and more odd harmonics, so this thing gets sharper? Yeah, that thing will get sharper. And right now, at some point, what will happen is it will be sufficiently sharp that it can fool your visual system, right? But uh, maybe a bird with a better visual system can say, aha, I still can see it's not quite a square wave yet. And we could add still more odd harmonics until that bird was satisfied that, that was a square wave. <laughs> if you give just the square wave and said turn it into frequency domain, that is not what I would come up with. You, you would not have come up with this, right? No, <laughs> Oh, this thing looks like two spikes? Yeah, okay. This is the space domain, right? And this is the frequency domain. I right? know. Yeah. I mean, when you add the different things, I can understand how you came up with this. Okay. But for example, like when you first introduced frequency domain, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and you had that one spike. Yeah, right. So that one spike is just going to look like that, right? Uh -huh. that, right? Okay. And if we had a different one spike, it would look like that. But if we added that guy to that guy, it would have this two spike picture, and it would be that one. Okay? Right? So and because that one is composed of many, many frequencies. Yes, right. And this just keeps going out here. Right? Okay. Now, maybe we don't need it to go all the way out here because you and I really can't do better than a certain range. But, okay? but that's a great question. Okay, real good. So that's, I think, a, a very uh, counterintuitive bit about all of this. Okay. Um, so then what we can say is, just in this simple example that we had given, we, we simplified things by having everything in phase. Everything was starting in phase. If we were to begin shifting the phase of these upper 
components. So we still use 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11. We go all the way uh, through the odd harmonics. If we start introducing phase shifts, all we want to show you here is that you can screw up the image. <laughs> that is to say that you can create a very different image just by manipulating the, the phase, the relative position of the, the particular harmonics. Okay? So the earliest image that we showed was a square wave. Uh, if you now introduce something like a 180 degree phase shift in these components, you can change the image. You, and, and those have different kinds of names. So something called a triangle wave, which has all the same components as a square wave does, but now the uh, odd harmonics have been phase shifted relative to the fundamental by 180 degrees. Right. So just a little uh, phase shifting there changes the outcome. And what this reminds us of is just that um, phase matters. Uh, and just in case you're wondering, here's a little downward stroke. And then over here, we have an upward stroke. Okay, so those are actually in two different starting phases, even though I hope you'll agree they're the same amplitude, they're the same frequency. And we're just changing the relative starting position that has a, an interesting consequence perceptually. Yeah, thanks. Yet another thing if it were a 180 yeah, this actually, th yeah, this is, uh, schematically here we're showing a 90, it actually should be 180. Uh, I mentioned on the video that yeah. in order to get the, um, the triangle wave, we really do need 180. Oh. Yeah, right, okay. So this is actually a 90 degree. But right, if, this, if we could show you the picture of the 90, it would look different from the square wave and different from the triangle wave. Right? So phase shifting uh, matters for us. So when we're looking around, uh, hopefully we're developing this notion that FAPO is really a nice description of how our visual system is working. Um, this 180 degree phase shift is a reminder that the P in FAPO matters very much. Okay, um, here's a, another fun example. Here's a picture of a real human being, and we can pull out from this lower spatial frequency components and higher spatial frequency components, right? All of this actually is inside of this, just like, as Becca was telling us a moment ago, that low spatial frequency sine wave is somehow embedded in that square wave, okay? We don't, we don't see it directly, but there are particular cells in our brain that actually do see that lower spatial frequency. There are others that are seeing the higher spatial frequencies. There are some cells that are basically picking up this information from this image. Other cells are picking up this information from that image. And the ensemble of neural firing that you have in your occipital lobe is going to give you this perceptually, even though some cells are basically seeing this within that, other cells are seeing that within that. Okay? Fourier had a tremendous insight. He actually wasn't speaking of the visual system, but the mathematics that he laid out set the stage for us to now know how the visual cortex is working. Really cool. Same thing over here. Here's one more example. This is the picture. Oh, we do have somebody from from um, Tennessee. Have you, have you seen this? Does the skyline look familiar to you? And that is, um, we have two people. Uh, so this is which city? Nashville. This is Nashville, okay? That's the Nashville skyline. And is that where Vanderbilt is? Yes. Okay, so one of the authors of our book is Randolph Blake, and he's at Vanderbilt. And I think he took this picture. And then he Fourier analyzed it. Hopefully you can see this is a blurry, low-pass, low-frequency low image. Right? And then over here, maybe you can't even make out the details. Sorry about that. There's some really high frequencies. Here's mid-range frequencies. We can pull all of these out and reassemble them as we need to. And we have different cells in our visual cortex that are doing that. Right. Yes, please, go ahead. Um, could you just go over low-frequency images? And <laughs> sure, okay. So let's, let's first go all the way back just to make sure that well, we're connecting our terminology from the earliest bit. And pardon me as I cursor through here. Okay, so this is going to be low frequency, and that's going to be high frequency, okay? So here, we have the cycles occurring over relatively large regions of space, and here that same cycle is occurring over a smaller region of space, okay? So let's now dial down to our picture of, we'll say Groucho Marx for a moment, and then we'll go back to the Vanderbilt skyline, if I can call it that, okay? So here is our original image, okay? And now what we can say is that you get down here a relatively solid dark bar, it isn't perfectly solid, right? But I think you'll agree that we have less light coming from here than we do from up here, right? Okay? So what we can say is that there might be cells that are picking up, like, maybe a horizontal orientation where there's light up top and dark on the bottom, okay? Over here, you might be able to see that we're getting a light-dark boundary, but that light-dark boundary is happening over that region of space. This light-dark boundary is happening over that region of space, okay? Low spatial frequency, high spatial frequency. Does that work for us? Yeah. Smaller. Yeah, smaller read, that's it. Okay, so smaller in space, okay, is higher in frequency because, because those two are inversely related, wavelength and frequency. So it does take a little bit of practice, right? So thank you for asking. Same thing here, and same thing for any picture that you, you could take on your cell phones, right? You can decompose this thing and get really high 
frequency components, lower frequency components. Same thing with my voice. Okay, even my voice, which sounds like maybe one tone, has higher frequency components, lower frequency components also. Elise has a question. Um, so for those with poor vision, like that original, the face in the middle kind of looks like what I see faces as when I'm not wearing contacts. Good, and I'm with you. Are you nearsighted like me? Yeah. I, okay, we're both nearsighted. Yeah. Okay, so a lot of times that's what's going on, but from a distance, this is what we see when we don't have our contacts in. How many people have that experience? Go ahead, Elise. Does it mean that the cells that are picking up the picture on the right are not functioning? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, the, the cortical cells that would be normally picking this thing up are not being uh, activated. And usually the reason they're not being activated is actually because of an optical problem. So you have a, uh, you, you have a misalignment of how the image is hitting your retina. Okay? And, and because we're not getting that nicely focused image on the retina, then the cells that would have been picking up very fine gradations on the retina um, are not getting any excitation. Then we put the contact lens on, and all of a sudden we get the focusing right, and that sends a signal back to the higher spatial frequency neurons, and they start doing their thing, and this guy turns into that guy when we've got... Okay. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so does that mean that the uh, cells that pick up the high frequency versus the low frequency are not uh, homogenous? homogeneously distributed throughout the retina? Oh, uh, yeah, I was going to say the cortex, right. right, okay? But actually, even within the retina, you're correct, that there are cells that have larger receptive fields. Here's larger receptive fields. There are cells in the retina that have smaller receptive fields, okay, right? Uh, and then those are going to tie back through the thalamus to cells that have larger or smaller receptive fields and back to the primary visual cortex where we have larger and smaller receptive fields. That brings us, that's actually a great transitional question. Um, so here we have these different diagrams that are showing the receptive field properties of different cells. First, who remember seeing these before? These on-center, off-center cells, okay? And this would be a low spatial frequency guy. This is a mid-spatial frequency. And this is a high spatial frequency uh, kind of cell, right? And so low, medium, and high, and then we can uh, tie that back to something like this. Right? Low, medium, and high spatial frequencies, if that works for us. So, and these can be at different places, as Owen is correctly pointing out, in the visual pathway. We can have some of this even inside of the retina. Uh, then we have these different sizes carried on again in the, uh, the LGN, that's in the thalamus, that's the relay station, that's in the center of our brains. And we have cells that are tuned kind of like this also all the way back here in our primary visual cortex. So when Elise has her uh, her glasses off. She's getting a lot of activity here and here, and not so much activity over here. And then she puts her glasses on, and she's getting the full spectrum. Right? She's getting all of those. Okay, pretty cool, I think. Okay. Now, what's really neat is we can see how this aligns for a. a this is the receptive field of a given cell. It's kind of an intermediate-sized cell, and you can see that this low spatial frequency stimulus doesn't really match that pattern very well. Almost the entire light area falls inside of this receptive field. Over here, we're getting too much dark and too much light in the off-center and on-surround. But over here, we're getting a lot of light decrements or lower light levels in the surround and a lot of high luminance stimulation in the center. So we're probably going to get the most firing uh, from this stimulus and less firing from this one or this one. This is our Goldilocks picture. Right? This one is too high spatial frequency. That's too hot. This one's too cold. This one's just right. We get a really nice match uh, of this distribution of light for that particular receptive field. Who's following that? Is that working for us? Okay. Looks like most of us are, are on that one. Here's what I was... Yes, please, go ahead. Um, that is, uh, there would be other cells that would fire to these. Yes, right. So if I... We need, yes, we need to shrink that size down. Harshit is right on there. And then we need to expand this guy. So if I can go back one or two slides. Okay, right, okay. So that would have been it. But for any one cell, right, uh, it turns out that was a good match for that particular cell. Okay. All right, so what's really neat about this, and again, uh, Fourier himself had no way of knowing this 200 years ago, but if we could take a patch out of your cortex, okay, what we'd find out is it's actually organized along some FAPO-related dimensions. So if we take an electrode and we start putting it through uh, a portion of your visual cortex, we'll find out that we get a pretty orderly sequence of low spatial frequency tuned cells, and then we move our our uh, electrode through a little bit more in the cortex and we see it's picking up higher frequencies, a little further higher frequencies still, a little further higher frequencies still. If we take Elise's glasses off, um, she tends to not get so much activity from this guy, okay, but she puts them back on and those are back in. 
If you go through a different angle through the cortex, you now pick up different orientations. And there's the O in FAPO. So this is the F in FAPO. Here's the O in FAPO. So we can get now different angles. Uh, and these cells will fire maximally. This is how we do our action potentials, right? With these, we're getting a lot of action potentials to this 45 degree angle. And then this column has a lot of action potentials to the horizontal and so forth. Uh, and it's actually quite neatly organized. Who's following that? Okay. Question on that. Go ahead, Archer. So that um, high frequency image of that man. Yeah. That, person, that would have maximum firing from the second column going all the way up. Uh, second column? This way? Mm-hmm. Because it was... Oh, because it was horizontal, yeah. right? And it was also low frequency, right? Yeah, so, yeah right. So it's going to be back that way. And that's really good. And Kirsten has a question also. Um, it might just be a little worrying, but so for frequency and orientation, that's just basically saying there is two different ways of entering the cortex? Two different ways of entering the cortex. I would say it this way. Uh, I wouldn't say there are two different ways of entering the cortex. I would say that the cells back here, for example, are tuned to that orientation. Okay, am I doing I'm sorry, it should be that way. They're tuned to that orientation. And they're tuned to relatively low spatial frequencies. So they're tuned to the combination of features. And when that cell is firing, that tells us that we've got a low spatial frequency that's angled this way. Okay? Does that work for us? Yeah. Great. Go ahead, June. Mm -hmm. It transmits all, all the information goes through like the whole visual cortex, but only certain parts of the visual cortex will react to like that frequency of information. That's right, that's right. So for example, if we had you looking at a stimulus up here that was this is really, really low sine wave, it was dark and a little bit lighter, here's very light and then a little bit darker, okay? Then as you're looking at that, and if we could just make that the whole wall is that, then the only portion of your brain that might be firing would be something like this. These guys wouldn't be firing. Yeah, but okay? the information would basically go through all of those, like all the whole section of the brain. Um, I would put it this way. Uh, what we would say is that we would get activity in some cells more so than others. Okay? And that pattern of neural firing would generate a particular perceptual effect. And we are perceptual psychologists this semester. And this, this would be the neural basis of that perceptual experience. Okay, one other bit. Um, this is a chance for me to be the proud husband. So this work of art that we have up here is something that I mentioned a, a moment ago. Uh, if you were to actually not schematize it so much, but take a, a real staining of a real brain of a real mammal, you would see something like this. I think you might find this intriguing. Um, here we go. Here's a Stryker paper. This is a, a paper that was published in the journal called Neuron in 1997. And what the researchers had done was they would show different stimuli. Sometimes they would show a bar that was vertically oriented. Sometimes they would show a bar that's horizontally oriented or diagonally oriented. And they're measuring in different portions of the cortex what the cells are responding to. Okay? And what you can do is generate something like a map where wherever you see yellow, for example, we have a region of cells that are responding best to vertical. Do people see that? Right? And then, let's see, is this dark purplish color or horizontal? And maybe we can find a dark purple maybe here or so. So there's a whole patch of cortex where, um, where we have cells that are responding to that. And then we can unpack that and we can show, you know, here's our yellow, for example. Uh, when we show just the yellow one, the dark areas are where we get a lot of firing. Okay? And then we change the orientation to this horizontal and we get a different set of uh, regions or a different set of areas that are responding um, to that, that ho horizontal stimulus. Okay? So this is really nice, a nice map of the uh, orientation tuning. And so what my wife has done, I'll turn the lights back on, uh, as our second anniversary gift, my wife knows that I study orientation and how we get better at seeing orientations when we practice. Uh, this is her quilt of that diagram. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Right? And so she's got the key over here. And this is really just a, a quilt that captures this particular diagram in the Neuron article um, by Stryker et al. A bunch of folks out at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco. Um, entirely a graduate program that makes these kinds of recordings in mammalian cortex, single cell recordings. I think I married up. I couldn't do this. <laughs> okay. So that, I hope, uh, shows you that it's actually a little bit uh, a little bit sloppier in the cortex than would be suggested by this cartoon that we get. But the cartoon is nice because it shows something of an orderly organization 
in the cortex for, in this case, orientation tuning or spatial frequency tuning. It might not be so ice cube-like in a real brain. It's more like that than like that, but you get the, you get the picture. Who's following that? Yeah, okay, real good. Okay, okay why don't we go ahead and do um, a couple of things. Why don't we do a, a demo that I think you'll find really interesting. Okay, uh, here's a demo that will help us to understand maybe the contrast sensitivity function. Okay, so we'll talk about metamers, and we know that metamers are physically different stimuli that are perceptually indistinguishable. One of the ways of thinking about this is metamers are, uh, metamers reveal to us a failure of discrimination. Okay, so we maybe can't discriminate a 590 wavelength from a much shorter and longer wavelength, right? Uh, so all those appear yellow to us. Metamers constitute a failure of discrimination. Okay? All right. Uh, and so we can talk about this human contrast sensitivity function that you saw in the video. And ours is going to be a little bit different from that of a cat's. And stimuli that are metameric for cats uh, might not be metameric for humans and vice versa. So let's see if we can, and we will need the lights down on this one because this is a pretty subtle demo. Okay. Okay. So let's show you a couple of pictures. As an example, we'll look at the following photos, and you'll be able to distinguish something that your cat might not be able to distinguish. So here are two photos, and um, I might ask you this question. Uh, first, can you tell that this one differs from that one? People, okay, there are really two different f uh, versions of the same image, but one of them has high spatial frequency, uh, more high spatial frequency information, and the other one has um, lower spatial frequency information only, it's missing the high spatial frequency. Which one is sharper, left or right? Left or, yeah, people are saying left, okay, on this side, so you get a really nice whisker out here and you kind of get the whiskers here. Okay. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to change the spatial frequency content of this just by optically moving you back. If I had more time and more space, I'd just ask all of you to move back that way. And as we increase the viewing distance, we actually have the same effect of increasing the spatial frequency content of this, interestingly enough. So I'm going to do the optical equivalent of that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make this image smaller. Oops, okay. And here we go. Okay, I've made the image smaller. And now by making it smaller, what's gone on is I've actually increased the spatial frequency content. It's almost as if you're at a, a greater viewing distance than you are now. How many people can still make, the, make out the difference between these two? By way of the whiskers, you can still see that they're different? Okay. All right, let's do another one here. Let's see if we can make this smaller again. Okay. And how many people can make that out? Most of us are still there. Okay, let's see if we can make that smaller again. Now they might be starting to look fairly similar. I mean, you, you happen to know that the one on the right is lower spatial frequency, but it might not be really obvious now. How many people find that to be fairly subtle? But, okay, and if we go really small, <laughs> okay, now what's happening is re this really is higher spatial frequency than that one, but we're now starting to challenge your system that your system actually can't make that discrimination anymore. Now a bird might be able to tell right away, yeah, that's high spatial frequency, that's low, but now we're starting to, to lose it, right? And then I think we can go one more. <laughs> Okay, right, right, okay. That would be what you would see if you were all the way at the end of the hallway. So this is now really high spatial frequency. We have now two um, cats in a very small region of space. And back over here, we have the same two cats in a very large region of space. So this is low spatial frequency, fat bars, fat cats. Here is high spatial frequency, thin bars, thin cats, high spatial frequency. Okay. So uh, there are now many more than two cats per unit space. Right? We have just the two of them there, but we could squeeze a whole lot more of those small cats into a unit of space. Either way, the spatial frequency is, yeah, <laughs> there goes Becca. Becca's trying to figure out what the spatial frequency content is there, okay? Expressed in CPD, uh, either cy uh, cycles per degree, or if you will in this demo, cats per degree, <laughs> okay? We now have more cats per degree of visual angle than we had a moment ago, okay? Who's following that? Okay, so we just changed the spatial frequency content by essentially moving you, even though I kept you in your seats, I optically moved you by making these things smaller. And there's a wonderful artist um, whose name is Chuck Close, and Chuck Close has this art, and maybe we'll end on this. If you walk into one of his art uh, exhibits, you'll see something like this, two different spatial frequency scales. Um, I'll let you look at that, okay? Don't yell it out, but maybe you know what this is. Yeah, some people are saying, ow, it's pretty salient, right? That's a, that's a lot to be taking in, okay? How many people can make out a particular image here? You know what this is. Some people know what this is. Some people don't know what this is. I'm going to now change the spatial frequency content and see if you know what this is. Maybe not yet. 
And maybe, maybe you're getting something cooking here. Maybe you're getting something there. Okay? Does anybody know what that is? It's an eye? And what, what else can we say about the eye? It has glasses on. Yeah, anybody know who's, who that is? That's the artist himself. He's drawing, this is a self-portrait. And he has this on a distant wall. When you walk into the museum from that side, you see him. And then as you walk up, you get this, and this, and this, until it's almost unintelligible at this really close bit. But he's playing around with the spatial frequency content just by changing the, the different uh, distances that you might view this at. Okay? No, nope, it's just a picture of Chuck Close, okay? <laughs> all right, all right. So, um, why don't we do it this way? We do have two minutes. Why don't we see if we have any ending questions? And Naomi, while you're up, can you flip those lights on so we can not trip on our way out? Okay, why don't we take one from Emily and one from Kirsten if we have time? Yeah, yeah. Right. That's right. So the question was, if you look at those, and they're called magic eye books, right, and you stare at them for a while, you let your eyes relax, and something comes out in three dimensions. That is actually interesting that you would ask. It's not the same phenomena. It's something called stereopsis that we're going to be studying in about a week and a half. Okay, we'll, we'll do some of those in, in class. Oh, I think we have time for one more. Go ahead, Kirsten. On the last slide, you just said you could fatigue the orientation problem or the spatial frequency problem. Sure. Okay, so what will happen is if we go to the very last slide on this, and we've seen this kind of a thing before, we'll go all the way back here. Okay. What we can do is we can reduce the firing rates by having people adapt. Uh, we can, for example, bring down the sensitivity by having you stare at something for a long period of time, and that makes you less sensitive. And we can do that in color, just like we did the other day with our color after effect. We can do that in orientation, or we can do that with frequencies. Okay? Okay, we're at 9.20. If you have other questions, please come on up and chat with me. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you all on Friday in this context, and I'll see some of you tomorrow in our research course. Have a great day. Um, this co-topic is the same one that you mentioned earlier where we become monochromats. Monochromats, yes, right, because that's going to be almost only rods cooking during a scotopic vision. Good. Mesopic is in between photopic, which is high levels, oh. and mezzo is in the middle. Uh, mezzo soprano, that's the whole thing, right? Mezzo soprano is a medium soprano. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. Size up? Right. How did they pick three Yeah, that is arbitrary. They could have used two, right? Yeah. Okay. They're just trying to give you, and earlier we, we had the low, medium, and high spatial frequencies, so, you know, we're trying to tie in on that. Uh, I, I don't have an office hour now, and I do have to prepare for a 10 o'clock, but, oh. but I wonder if we might, if you might, can stay with me, we'll let Dr. Kennedy come in, okay. uh, and maybe as we're going down the hall, we can chat about some things. Go ahead, Jenny, I'm listening. I'm sorry, which one was it? Like having tried in the point five point luminance profile. Sure, right. Okay. So we might do something like zero 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 one 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 for dark is zero and one is light. Okay, so right. it's like as simple as, as that. Yeah, right, right. Zero 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 okay. one one one. And the higher spatial frequency would be zero zero one one, right? If, okay. Does that work for us? Yeah, yeah that, that works too. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Like yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. What's this for job or this is for city here? Go ahead, Harshad, I'm listening. I'm listening.